Can we give Miriam another round of applause for being so amazing? I know she, she hates when I say this, but um, if you don't follow her on Twitter, you should start following her right now before she like blocks you all. But um, <sighs> so here we are. So my name is Piper Anderson. I'm going to be um, facilitating this conversation today with our incredible um, practitioners, panelists. And I don't know about you all, but when, whenever I hear the word harm, things start to churn inside of me, right? And I think this conversation really uh, requires us uh, demands of us that we, we really be in our bodies. So to start us off, we're just gonna take a moment to, to arrive. So wherever you are in the body that you're in, in the way that feels comfortable, just take a moment to turn inward. And without judgment, just notice what you're feeling right now. Notice any sensations that you might be feeling in your body. Places where you're feeling pressure, changes in temperature or movement. And just noticing without judgment. Noticing and bringing curiosity to that. And in the way that is possible for you today in this moment, notice your chest rise and fall as you breathe. Notice the places where your body is touching the seat or the floor. And from this place of just being with yourself, just name to yourself how you're feeling right now, being in this room, being a part of this conversation. And know that that is right and okay and just where you need to be. So when it feels right, if your eyes are closed, you can begin to bring them into the room. And I want to thank you for being here today, for showing up just as you are and being a part of this conversation. The framing of today is building accountable communities. I think it's an important framing because it challenges us to consider the work of accountability, not merely as the responsibility as of those who uh, have been identified as harm doers, but as all of our responsibility. Um, a set of practices that are necessary for creating generative community. The practitioners joining us today have spent decades thinking about the question of accountability and how we reclaim accountability as a generative practice of community. How do we reclaim accountability from the criminal legal system, 
reclaim it from white supremacist structures founded in punishment. I've asked them to approach this opening plenary as a dialogue amongst each other and with you all. And I invite you to listen with your whole selves. And notice the ways that your body is speaking back to you, responding to this dialogue, and be in curiosity about what comes up for you in this conversation and throughout the day. I think we once, and our ancestors once, possessed a repertory of practices around accountability that have been lost as a result of structural violence and genocide. And I think our work today and as future ancestors is to really rebuild that repertory of accountability practices and language and ways of being with each other so that we can move in the direction of the kinds of communities, families, and organizations that we thrive in. And I'm grateful that we have um, an incredible panel of, of practitioners who can really speak to that for us and open this conversation up for us. So in a moment, I'm gonna ask them each to, um, to start us off with some opening remarks, and I'll ask um, Esteban to start us off, and then we'll move down the line. Um, sorry, I know you, you, sat at, you sat on the end. You sat on the end. It was, it was bound to happen at some point. I know. I, it was either, it was going to be one or the other. It's like, ah. Oh. I'm nervous. We're good. We're good. I know, you know, it's okay. Good. Know. good. But now you know. I, I, gave you, I gave you a heads up. Now, now you know. know. Um, so opening remarks from each of them so we can get to know, uh, you know how they, uh, a little bit more about their work and how they arrive at, at, um, at this conversation. Uh, and then they have been uh, gracious enough to trust me to um, offer a couple of questions to um, dig deeper into this conversation. And then uh, we have the index cards going around and if you have a question at any point, uh, just find someone who has an index card um, and uh, grab one and write your questions down. Uh, and then we'll take those and we'll, we'll try to respond to as many of them as we can at the end. So, we're going to get started. Esteban, you ready? Hi, I'm All so right, ready. I'm all so right, ready. great, great. Kick us off. Good morning, everybody. So, um, I wanted to share three things that I do that inform my, why I'm in this dialogue with y'all, um, and how I think about these questions, all the questions throughout the day, but especially for the discussion we're about to have. Um, I am from New York City, this area, but I live in Philadelphia, and one of the, one of the ways that I actually ended up meeting many of you who are in the room uh, was through a collective that I did not found. It's one of the things I didn't found. I didn't. I was not a founder of, called Philly Stands Up. And <laughs> why do you guys know about Philly Stands Up? Uh, <laughs> it's so goofy to me because Philly Stands Up uh, was this very small DIY punk collective that wasn't even fully founded by the initial members. It was really founded by a group of women who were in a survivor support group called Philly's Piss, who were like, y'all, cis dudes need to get your shit together um, and do this work. And so it was less of a calling to the work and being called in to do the work, which was already interesting. And it was all um, mostly young white people who were part of a subcultural punk community. Um, and this all happened out of a moment of harm that, that came out of a gathering, I was about to say like this, but very much unlike this. Uh, because it was, it was like a, a, a hardcore festival where people came to Philly from all around the country and, um, and incredible acts of harm and violence took place. And it took place in our community and it just so happened that these punks, because we're in Philly, like everyone in Philly is an organizer, even, even the, like, the middle class white punks. So they got organized and, and that work 
um, happened just a few months before I uh, relocated from California to back to the East Coast and, and moved to Philly. Um, and when I got to Philly, some of the women in, who I was in community with actually asked me to, to join this, this group, this collective, um, and get involved in that work. And um, 15 years later, <laughs> I've, I've, uh, I've learned a lot of lessons of what it looks like to hold um, people who've caused harm accountable, specifically in situations of intimate partner violence and sexual assault. Um, and even to hold people accountable where, in situations where we were, we were called to hold processes where there wasn't um, necessarily a survivor present, where people were coming to us and being like, this thing happened in my life seven or eight years ago, I hear you do this work. Um, the other two things I have less to say about, uh, which is that I am a founder, co-founder of a group called Aorta, which stands, thank you, uh, which stands for, I came up with the name, y'all, and I feel like you need to know this, okay? It was literally me, okay. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, branding movement skills, okay, so. <laughs> It stands for Anti-Oppression Resource and Training Alliance, and uh, we, are, we do a lot of work supporting not just communities in a, in a diffuse way or in a local way, but, um, but also organizations, um, organizational culture, workplace culture, nonprofits, um, community uh, campaigns and different projects, um, working with them on uh, being, being catalysts for the work that they're trying to do. Um, and so in that work, we've been called on to uh, help fit people, leaders, organizations figure out what, is, what does accountability look like. So we can talk about that. Um, and the last is that I'm the executive director of the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. And part of why that's relevant is that um, as a model, not just of like old ass communities, like we've been doing, we've been in community forever, but what does it look like to reform um, in, in a future oriented way, to reform um, and insert economic democracy into our workplaces. Um, and so that work, all the time I'm hearing from our members, we're, we're uh, like post-capitalist business trade association. Um, we, we're, we're hearing all the time from our own members about the importance of, in the context of workplace democracy, how do we figure out how everyday people who are running, who are their own managers and bosses, we've gotten rid of traditional management structures, how are we doing this work? So that's, those are some of the hats that I'm bringing in, in coming into this conversation. Thank you, and thank you for sticking to the three minutes. Um, just a reminder to all of our panelists that we're doing three minutes for opening remarks, and because um, I want to make sure that we have lots of time for conversation, I'm going to be the, the timekeeper. Um, RJ? Uh, thanks, Piper. Hello, everyone. Um, a little context. Do I get to say anything about accountability in this opening um, remarks as well? Okay, yeah. cool. That's you have the mic. That's All right. The power. Okay, thank you. I'll use my three minutes as I see fit. Um, so just a little bit of context, um, bringing to this question around what is accountability uh, experience in a collective called the Challenging Male Supremacy Project, which operated from about 2008 to 2014. Uh, similar to what Esteban was naming, but here in New York City, being part of different social justice organizing, and uh, seeing a lot of sexual violence, and seeing that it was mostly women, femme of center folks who were doing the work to address gender-based violence, and seeing that we had to organize uh, to step up and do our part to address it, since it was mostly men and masculine of center folks that were causing that violence. Um, and that was a transformative justice-based all-volunteer project. Uh, the other experience that I'm bringing to this question is my current work uh, as a staff member at Common Justice, uh, which is a restorative justice-based program. Uh, it's the first program in the country that is a victim service program and alternative to incarceration for uh, serious and violent felonies in the adult courts. Uh, so my day-to-day -day work is working with people who um, have assaulted, robbed, um, done home invasions, and have been caught up in the criminal legal system as it actually exists, um, and finding a way for uh, people who have been impacted by that to actually get culturally relevant victim services and for the folks who caused harm, who are the folks I work with, uh, to instead of spending time in prison, uh, do something that is actually incredibly hard uh, and try to be accountable for what they've done. And I think that's the big thing I wanted to share right off the bat about accountability is that it's really fucking hard. 
Um, <laughs> for everybody, right? Um, but what? It, but it's so different than this notion of tough on crime. Like we talk about, you know, we're going to be super tough on crime, and that means these really long prison sentences and all these things. And the difference between that and accountability is that accountability is actually really active. Like the court system doesn't actually invite the survivor to do very much at all, right? The penalty is, is that you committed a crime against the, the, law, the laws of the state, right? And so it's the state that's seeking some sort of redress, right? Prison just requires that you suffer under its actions against you, right? What's extremely hard to do is to actually sit with the person or the people you harmed, right? To sit with that moment of harm, to sit with the ways that that act of violence in that moment then rippled out into people's lives, families, communities. Uh, then to have to start to figure out, like, what are the things I could do to make this thing as right as possible? Knowing that, that I don't have a time machine, like, what can I do now? And then lastly, like, what is the work that I need to do to transform myself so that I can ensure the person or the people that I harmed that I'm never going to do that thing again, right? That's super hard work. So when we actually talk about getting serious about public safety, when we get serious about talking about survivor-centered work, when we get serious talking about fighting for racial equity, right, I think... That is what accountability might live up to if we, if we do it right and doesn't get co-opted and everything else. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Leah. Um, and first off, I just uh, wanted to say that it's really important to note that you cannot do this work alone. Um, and it's, uh, I just uh, wanted to uplift how important it was for me to do this work uh, around just incredible support of other people and that nothing would have happened without those important groups of people. And um, some folks, unfortunately, um, from my collective wanted to come and weren't able to because this event uh, was so popular and sold out. So I really just want to bring them in the room here too because everything I'm sharing comes out of that kind of shared labor uh, of so many people. and. There's nothing I'm sharing that was something that wasn't uh, part of that sharing. Um, so I got involved in this work, um, starting out by being involved in a circle process in my community that was not successful. Um, so that was my, my first experience was unfortunately accountability not achieved um, in that situation. But having had that experience, um, it, um, uh, it motivated me to join a collective called Support New York. Um, that was uh, active here in New York. Um, that actually is very similar to what Esteban uh, spoke about and, and Support New York was actually really in influenced and, and mentored by Philly Stands Up. Um, Support New York started uh, in around 2005. I, I joined later, but um, we were also doing a lot of work out of moments of crisis that had escalated. Um, it was a moment when this work, uh, there was a lot more resistance to this kind of work, um, and there was a lot of, of conflict happening, a lot of schisms, and uh, it felt like a lot of struggles and fights just to, to even do accountability work and get people on board with that. Um, and similarly, we were working in a predominantly white anarchist community as well, which I think is important to uh, think about, because we were working with a lot of people who weren't going to deal with criminalization likely or consequence uh, without uh, that accountability. Um, and I think we'll talk more about what success looks like in terms of accountability, but I, I do feel like some of the work I did actually was successful, and I think it's important to uplift that that's possible. <laughs> um, and another thing I think we'll talk about is in building accountability, uh, excuse me, in building accountable communities, uh, I think what's come up a lot is the idea of shared values. Um, so I've, I've also done a bit of work um, working on safer space policies and, and other ways of, of uh, discussing our values. Um, and a lot of that, uh, a majority of that work happened in the space of Occupy Wall Street. Um, not gonna talk about that much, um, but um, I, I worked with folks to try to develop from a large and space with so many people coming together with so much violence happening to try to develop community agreements that could be shared, some kind of principles <laughs> that people could come into the space and share, and I think um, we can talk about, too, what it means to, to come together in a community and create shared values that people can then hold themselves accountable to. 
Um, so Support New York sunsetted our work in uh, 2016, um, and then we spent a couple years developing a curriculum that I'm happy to share with folks. Um, it's on transformharm.org, so shout out to transformharm.org. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Sonia, um, and uh, I, I also want to say sort of two things. Um, one, a little bit about the way that I come by this work and how I just come by being in this room. Um, and the other is just a little bit of like love about like, what it, accountability. Um, so I come to this work um, by, or I come here via being actually growing up here in New York um, on 97th Street. Um, I live in the Bay Area now, and I'm a part of a beautiful restorative justice community that is deeply embedded with racial justice and thinking about systems of oppression. Um, I come by this work via my parents, who, my mother, who was a forced migrant from, by my father uh, from South Asia. I come by this work by my grandparents uh, and my grandmothers, who were never allowed to read or write, um, were illiterate, but had repertoires of thousands of songs and rituals. Um, I come by this work of being a survivor of child sexual abuse. Um, I come by this work of joy and resiliency and love for people and community. <clears throat> and I think that's sort of my transition into accountability. So here's what I want to say about accountability. I think that accountability is a fierce, radical, amazing way to choose to stay in relationship to each other while acknowledging that harm can happen and actually that we're all going to hurt each other at some point. Right? So it's this radical way of saying, I choose you. I choose relationship. I choose community. I'm going to stay in community with you. I'm not, there's no throw away. We can't throw each other away. Um, and that we're going to harm each other. It's going to happen. Right? Get two people in a room, it's going to happen. And the spectrum can be this big of harm, and the spectrum can be all the way to rape and child sexual abuse and you know homicide. Right? So. Um, I think that's really important to say. And I think the things that, I, here's also what I want to say. I want to say that I think accountability has to become, I love this idea that it has to become a norm, a cultural social norm. Like it should be like we're going in the car with my kids and I'm like, did you put your seatbelt on? How are you feeling today? Are you happy or sad? Is there anything you need to be responsible for today? <laughs> like, right? Like we know about the seatbelt campaign and what it did. What, the accountability campaign can do the same thing. And the reality is that it's true. It's like so freaking hard to do. Um, it's the hardest thing to do because it requires so much self-reflection and dealing with my shame and, oh my God, did I do something wrong? Um, it requires that we deal with the fact that we don't come from a culture that is socialized to care about each other. We, do, we haven't developed, we have let supremacy and being right and capitalism and patriarchy create the divisions of our otherness, right? We have, to, we have to like hold those things, right? It requires that we begin a culture of coming from empathy, from listening, from being socialized to care for each other um, and putting that at the center. And it requires that we restore relationship and community to the sacred place that it deserves to be and that we actually all know how to do that in our bones and our ancestors and just if we look in each other's eyes. Um, so I just want to say that as a starting out. And then I want to say one more thing, which is I'm so happy to be here um, with all of you. And I'm so happy to uh, be in a transformative justice community accountability space um, as a person that maybe comes from a little bit more of a RJ lineage. But, you know, there's so much deep respect and love for folks that are just doing work um, to end harm that's not using the state, right? And that there are different ways in any movement that things have gotten co-opted and used the wrong way and that there's still good people doing work in different places. And that, that we can see each other, that we walk our talk, that we work together is also a part of this work. It's not tearing down movements, it's building them up um, and building up the people that are doing the work, really doing the work in that movement to uh, keep doing the work. So, thank you. Thank you. That was so beautiful, Sonia. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm like, I'm having all these feelings. I was like, okay, all right. I mean, I can have the feelings and talk with you all. Um, <laughs> a 
lot of practice in that. Um, good morning, I'm Shannon Perez Darby. And um, as I was getting ready to share, uh, I'm safest in talking about my work in uh, intellectualizing. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna actually start with something a little more personal. And then I immediately was like, oh, right, that's, I can feel that feeling of what it is to share. Um, and not just be like, here's a definition of accountability for you. Um, <laughs> And so I come by this work like many of us come by this work, which is I was in what I call a wackadoo relationship. Um, that's often safer than calling it abusive because it's just confusing, right? Like the stuff is confusing. Um, but I know it is a relationship that brought me to my knees and that reorganized how I thought about my life and how I thought about my safety and how I thought about being in community. And I didn't have, and it, it reorganized my life. I didn't know how to move forward. Uh, we coexisted in a small queer community, uh, cutie pop community, and there was no one else but us. Um, and there was no other community to go to. Uh, it was a place we had both grown up, and I tried everything I knew how to do in order to coexist with this person. I tried being in conversation with them, I tried getting other people's help, I tried not talking to them, I tried um, everything short of going to the state to get help. Um, and nothing I did produced uh, something that felt like it worked. Um, and actually what I did was I moved to Seattle. <laughs> um, I left uh, that community. And that question was, and that experience was so um, reorganizing to me that it basically set me on the last you know, tw 12 years uh, of a journey of being like, what could have worked? Like what actually, could have meant that I didn't have to leave my hometown. I probably had to leave my hometown anyway. But uh, <laughs> what did I not have to like, literally every time I go back there, I start to feel anxious and it is a place of actually trauma for me and not a place where I feel like so excited to go home. Um, and where I wouldn't have had to do that and where I wouldn't have had to break relationship with people um, and literally leave because there was nowhere else to be um, in my community. And I went to my movements. I was deeply in community with people. Um, one of the things about that relationship is it didn't separate me from my community. I actually was in deep community with folks while that wackadoo situation was happening. Um, and my communities didn't have answers for me. Uh, I wanna say this, let's see how it goes. Uh, I, that person that I was in a relationship with, we both worked at the one queer anti-violence organization in the community, like together. Um, and so there was nowhere else. We did not have the solutions. Um, and so I was like, well, we better figure it out. And so for me, what I did was I, uh, I went and for me, 12 step work was actually where I got a lot of that healing because my communities did not have the tools and the 12 step community that I went to did. They told me and they gave me tools for how to look at myself and look at my own actions and behaviors because I was not in control of what that person did. Like I could not, boss that person. They were not in control of, like, I could not tell them where to be and not be. They did not give a fuck. Um, and so all I was in control of was, like, what I did with myself. And so I got tools for how to, like, reconcile and how to heal and how to be in right relationship with myself. Also through spiritual practices um, that helped me learn how to be in my body. And I, you know, I'm gonna, t I talk lightly about that for lots of reasons. Um, <laughs> But that was what I, where I really learned how to do the work of accountability. But through 12-step work was how I learned how to do that. And it's actually one of the only places that gave me really organized ways was to say like, hey, I fucked up. I did something that was not aligned with who I wanna be and my values. Let me go make that right. And let me get your permission to, tell, to make amends for a harm I've done. Um, and that was the healing tool that set me to reconcile that time in my life. Like, and good news is that time in my life is, it is healed. Like that is not a place that's hot for me anymore. Mm -hmm. That is like, I can talk to you now, grounded in my body about it. If that person who very well might be in this room, hey. Um, if that person, <laughs> I was saying, that person lives in New York, so hey, if you're here. Um, uh, if that person walked up to me right now, I can stay in my body and be grounded and right here. And so like that, I just say that to say like, that was possible, and if you talked to me 10 years ago, like, I would be panic crushing, like, just crushed on that. So, like, I just like to also start with this, like, healing is possible, and I got there through the work of accountability. And so we'll talk more, I think, a little bit about, like, my thing is, like, accountability is a personal skill, as the building blocks and the foundations to get to do that together. And so I'll leave it with that for the moment, but hopefully I get to say more about that.
All right. Hi. Good morning. How are you all? Yeah. Hey. I'm like seeing everybody I know here. It's so wonderful. Um, so what I want to say is my name is Mia, and um, a lot of how I come to this work is being a survivor of child sexual abuse uh, within the medical industrial complex and then also by a community member. Um, and one of the things that drives me a lot is I do work around ending child sexual abuse with the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective. Woo! And thank you. All the way out in NYC, it's nice to feel the love. <laughs> Um, and one of the things that drives my work a lot is thinking about what would it mean to create a world that's safe for disabled children of color? What, what would that world have to look like and feel like and be like every single day so that any of us would be able to exist with love and not have to feel violence and all of those things? Another thing that drives my work um, is none of the people who sexually abuse me will ever be accountable. And when I think about what it would take to build up our forces to be able to take on something as large as the medical industrial complex, um, that drives my work as well. And I think if we, can get, if we can get down the stuff between us, then that gives us a fighting chance, right? If we think about like the low-hanging fruit, and I don't mean that in a way that means that it's easy, because it's not at all. But if we can get to the low-hanging fruit, then maybe we can build our skills, right? And build up our capacity to go higher than that. Um, the BATJC, it's a lot of letters, <laughs> the BATJC, we work to build and, build and support transformative justice responses to child sexual abuse. And I just want to say that I think that child sexual abuse is a strategic site for liberation and prison abolition work because it is one of the first places that the most vulnerable members of our community are being harmed. And it is one of the first places where new generations of harm are starting and new cycles of harm and violence are starting. And so it's a strategic site to break generational cycles of violence. And it's a strategic site for prison abolition as well because Child sexual abuse, CSA, gets used all the time to argue for harsher and harsher sentences, for more and more prisons, for more and more police. Um, and I could go on and on, but... So I want to say that. I also want to agree and follow up with Shannon that accountability is not a destination, it's a skill, it's a practice that we can build. And I think Shannon's story illustrates so perfectly that, you know, I always tell survivors this, like, your healing cannot depend on their accountability because they may never take accountability. And so, obviously, so clearly healing is possible without that, as Shannon has so beautifully illustrated for us. But I think that when we start to think about um, TJ interventions or TJ processes as though accountability is the only way that things can be okay or that's the only thing that we're focusing on, I think we lose sight of what's really happening. And I also think that it's another form of rape culture that invisibilizes survivors and makes us focus more on the person who caused harm. Um, I also, when I think about accountability, I think about it as a muscle and a skill that we can build up. And I always say that I think we should start with ourselves because I think we all want other people to be accountable. We all are like, those people need to be accountable. But I bet that there's a lot of shit even in this room that is going down that we haven't even discussed and we're not gonna get to today. So I, I just really always try to bring it back to ourselves. Is that three minutes yet? Thank you, Mia, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, yes. Thank you. So we're hearing that accountability is relational that it is also a personal commitment and practice, that it is many things, that it's not just sort of a, a, a set protocol. If we do these five things, we've got accountability, right? Which is what I think is kind of happening now in the era of Me Too. I've had a couple people come call me and apologize and they had the formula down. I was like, damn, that was a good apology. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> you hit all the, the key points. Okay, great. And I think, you know, so, so we can develop, like, and, and this is sort of the defanging and the, the co-optation of, of accountability, so we can develop the language, right? We can say the right things, but, but what I'm hearing is that it is, a, it is a dynamic process, right? 
It is something that we have to be committed to over time. It never stops. And it also forces us to sort of break this um, false kind of binary between the harm doer and the harmed. That every single one of us must be accountable in our lives, in our relationships. And so I wonder if you could all talk about, or, you know, you don't, you don't all have to respond to this, but if you want to, um, you can, um, how you invite people in, in, a, in a culture, in, in a punishment culture, right? Like in a country founded on slavery, founded on punishment, uh, a criminal legal system that has co-opted the work of accountability. How do you invite people into this more humanistic approach to, to accountability? I think you start by modeling it. I mean, I don't know how to ask people to do a thing that I have not practiced myself. Um, and so part of the thing about this kind of accountable communities framing is it a framing where we create the conditions to make accountability possible. It's, um, it's not actually asking somebody to be accountable or making them be accountable. It's actually making it the condition so that when they say yes, I use this example all the time because it's literally true for everybody. Yes, I didn't do the dishes and I said I would do the dishes and I'm gonna make a plan about that. Because there's no collective place where you have not had a fight about the dishes. Like whether it's your office, whether it's your home, people can't struggle around the dishes. Um, and so like let's start with the fucking dishes. Um, and making a plan about that and making it like possible. So you, if you said, hey, I fucked up here. I did not do, I was not aligned with my values. So this is also the piece here is like we're not, um, we're not accountable to some magical outside concept. We're accountable to our own set of who we want to be in the world, of our values, of our who we're trying to be. That's what you're being accountable to. Um, not somebody else's idea of who you should be or what you should be. And so we make it possible for people to do that by saying like, by having um, what I call often um, like reasonable consequences. So that like, it may be that like, you've got to do the dishes extra, like to kind of offset how everyone else has been doing your dishes for a month. Um, but it isn't that you lose your job or for, you know, for that example, that's not an appropriate, like, it's an appropriate consequence for not doing the dishes. So having the consequences be right-sized and appropriate um, and just practicing it and modeling it. So I try as often as I can to model like, yeah, I was not aligned with my values and here's what I'm gonna do about it. And being clear before I say that, that I can actually knock off the behavior that I'm gonna say. So you don't end up in the situation where you're apologizing for something that you're just gonna do again. Um, so I think in modeling it and creating the conditions that when people do come forward and say there's a, a harm they did or something wasn't aligned, that actually like, they're being supported in a grounded and appropriately sized way. So I agree with that, oh, and uh, I want to. I want to, <laughs> but I want to back it up a little more because I, the the piece of that that I think is important as an initial step is setting up relationships that make it possible and make you approachable and make you trustworthy of holding accountability. <coughs> and so, like a thousand percent, what you just said about like what is the work you're doing to to show up. Um, and be, be worthy of a relationship where that, can, that can contain accountability in the face of patterns of entrenched and historical trauma and violence and punishment, where like we have all been told culturally to not admit guilt, to not show up for account, like to all of that, right? So that's like a thousand percent true. And I actually think that the first step is it's further removed from that. I think, I think if we begin by opening with, hi, I'm ready to be accountable, like we're setting ourselves up for failure. Right, and so the work is actually, we need more nuance and it does need to start with communities, movements, people who, who are holding these values before we can really mainstream them. But I think we need to be able to hold some nuance and say, you know what, showing up for an accountability, to be accountable for an accountability process is not an admission of guilt. It's not, um, it's not your moment, that's what the work is. That's like almost the end point. That's the final, that's the final <laughs> lap is being like, oh, I finally understand that I'm here because there's something for me to be accountable to. And so the work that we, so much of the work that we've um, had to do in calling people in for processes was, is actually being like, so first of all, we're not gonna call the cops. Second of all, um, showing up and agreeing to be in a process is not an admission of guilt. And having to say that on repeat, having to say that indirectly through their, through their homies, through their housemates, through their dates, through everyone, and even having to say that to the community Right, so that it, there is this sense in the in the in the public nowadays, social media, 
that even outing or be disclosing the fact that you're in an accountability process, right, is seen as some admission that of culpability. And so like, we need to do a whole other set of work of just being like, accountability just means like you're agreeing that we're in community. That's all that even means. And then it's not what the process is, it just means you are, we are coming in the door and we're all, we're all agreeing to be in the room and then the work actually happens. And so I think there, there does need to be this thing around accountability of, of being able to tolerate, to tolerate harm or to, to, to tolerate people without tolerating harm. Um, and, and once we start getting some of that nuance in there, I think it becomes a little more possible for people to be like, oh, I'm willing to be on this journey. I'm willing to acknowledge that you have a story that is not my story of what went down, of who I am, of like, who is, who is the villain, right? Because nine times out of 10, the person who's like, you need to be accountable, they're like, the fuck I do? You need to be accountable, right? So like, anyway, I, so, so I, I think backing it up to that is, is an important first step. I, okay, oh, <laughs> all gonna jump in. Um, God, like, you know, I'm just getting hot, like, yeah, thinking yeah. about it, because it's like, there's a way that it's like, we're all swimming in this, that there's so many avenues and dive points to kind of get into. So I wanna say this, like, piggybacking on everything, too, is that there's a way, like, we have this saying in our work, right, that shame is about, like, kind of makes you feel like you're a bad person and guilt is about saying that you did something wrong, right? And that punishment is like institutionalized shame, right? It's like, it's like you're a bad person, you don't deserve to be here, you, don't, you shouldn't exist, you should get thrown away. Like, that's what incarceration is, right? That's what punishment systems are. Well, like accountability systems are like, oh hey, you know, we did, we did some things wrong here and we need to like deal with that and we're not bad people and so, there's something about, kind of, as Esteban was saying, about this constant reminder and being invited into a conversation about accountability is a constant reminder to the person to, um, that you're creating a space that is non-shaming and non-judgmental, even if you're mad as fuck, you know? Even if what happened wasn't okay. And the survivor gets to be as pissed as they wanna be and as upset as they wanna be. They're all these truths at the same time, right? So the person that felt the harm gets to be mad and sad and hurt and traumatized. And the person that did the harm has to know that you are in a space where you're able to hear and listen. And I just wanna also reiterate something you said about like folks expect that like, well that person's not being accountable and something just happened. Accountability as a journey is that folks learn how to. If we, if we don't know how to, if we don't know that it's okay to not be in a shameful pace, if we don't deal with our shame, if we don't deal with our trauma, if we don't deal with all those things, how are we ever gonna get there? So the more relationship we build with people that are in that space, the deeper it is possible for someone to actually trust that it is actually okay to say the things that you need to say, right? And so like dealing even with when someone's you know, trying to be accountable, of course there's like trauma. You know, A lot of times it's coming from trauma. A lot of times it's also coming from privilege and making even distinctions when accountability needs to come for, is coming from trauma and privilege. And how do you actually, even the process with which you approach someone who's coming out of trauma is helping to heal the trauma, to get to a place where they can be accountable. When it's coming out of privilege, it's like, to be in relationship to always understanding that power over is not liberatory for anybody. It's damaging for all of us. And if you wanna be in community and relationship, you have to be in relationship to that, right? So that's what I would add if there was more. Um, well, I just wanted to say one of the ways that I do it is I start with self accountability because I feel like most of us are so unaccountable to ourselves. Most of us are in an abusive relationship with ourselves. Like let's, and that lays the groundwork it lays the groundwork for an abusive world. Like, Snatched let's just be wigs, real talk. Wigs have flown off. I, I just want to say, I was cold. <laughs> oh, God. I was cold before. I got my jacket on, so let's go. Like, I <laughs> but that's often how I start, is I'm like, what do you need to be accountable for? to yourself, not because Mia told you to, but because you need to take care. What if we thought of self-care as self-accountability, actually? That taking care of ourselves is how we are accountable in this world. 
that, that you are too important for this movement to not take care of yourself, right? You gotta do the dishes, you gotta do your laundry, you gotta, you gotta find joy in your life, you gotta have good and healthy, solid relationships who want the best for you, who don't want you to come out to an event even when you don't feel good, who are like, stay home, rest, I love you, right? Like, instead of being like, trying to guilt you to come to some kind of party or something, like, I feel like that's where I start. And every time I do a TJ training that has any kind of length to it, we always do a self-accountability homework ex like activity where people pair up and I'm like, okay, pick, pick one thing that you want to be accountable to yourself on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the, not I want to heal my relationship with my father or something, but like, you know, <laughs> I, like I want to drink more water in the day or you, you, come on, work with me. And like, but, but then you have to check in with that person, and so you learn how to, you learn how to help support someone to take accountability, because we want to move from holding people accountable to supporting them to take accountability. Obviously, we're not there yet. We're gonna have to keep holding people accountable. That's real. But the world that we strive for is one where you proactively take accountability for yourself, where you say, I didn't send out the agenda for that meeting. Before someone says, where is the fucking agenda for the meeting, <laughs> right? So, I feel like when we start there, yeah. that it becomes really accessible. And also, I want to say that, like, I know, what if accountability wasn't scary? Like, what if we built a world and a culture mm -hmm. where accountability is not scary? It will never be easy or comfortable. But what if it's not scary? And what if it's not something that we're running from? And because honestly, a lot of people don't care whether they do something wrong. They're more afraid of getting caught. We got to shift that shit. Yes, yes. I think, I think, so, I, because, and I think part of what you're saying is that, yeah, yeah, you can apply that, you can apply that, absolutely, please, please. People were like, oh, shit, she just snatched my wig off? I didn't come here for that, no. So, I, I think what you're speaking to is like, you know, is, is, you know, that when people hear the word accountability, what they're really hearing, what that translates to in their minds is punishment, yeah. is a shaming, is a, is, a, is a public flogging, right? Like, we're gonna be, you know, a, you know uh, isolated, separated, like, that's immediately what, what people go to. So how do we sort of, like, shift that, right? Um, I think is a part of it, right? So that we reclaim the language of accountability as something that is uh, essential to uh, to how we engage in community and how we engage with ourselves. And I think, you know, and I think something you brought up is trauma, right, which I think is also a part of the, the loss, right, as well, is that, you know, accountability really is a core human capacity, right? We, we are born with this capacity to, to show up, to name things, right, to be in relationship. Tra what trauma then does is really really destroys that, right? You know, uh, I think about like, you know, uh, throughout most of my 20s, like, you know, my, when I was deep in trauma, avoidance, and we live in an avoidance culture, but avoidance was my like, that was my number one strategy. It was like, I'm gonna hide until you change. <laughs> Once you change and I'll come out, I'll, I'll show up then, right? But you gotta change first, right? And, and what that does is like, it doesn't allow us to be human, it doesn't allow us to show up fully in relationships, to be our best selves. It's like, how do we, one, how do we reclaim the language of accountability, but also how do we restore, like what's the pre-work, right? And restoring and healing and restoring that core competency that we all possess, that we've all had at some point or another uh, to be uh, in right relationship and, and be accountable in the process. So thoughts on that? Leah, did, are you, I feel like you were gonna say something before. Did you wanna jump in here? Uh, yeah. I, I don't know if, I, sorry, I gotta keep this on. I don't know if this uh, totally responds to that, but I think a word that came up that I think is really important is trust. Um, and another one I wanna throw out there, which may relate to what you just said, is generosity. Um, and I, I think about that a lot when, um, that there's generosity on all sides involved when people are, are truly entering into accountability in a like true and honest way. Um, and I think there's, there's huge generosity in being someone who's like, I was harmed, but I trust you enough and I'm being generous enough to like imagine this way that we can like move forward, that you can transform being harmful 
um, and there's generosity in, in, in going to the other side of, of that shaming and that, that hard moment of being like, wow, you know, I did something, and, and as Esteban uplisted, like, maybe you're not there at day one, um, maybe that's, that's the journey is to get there, but to, to be willing to, like, sit down and be in community and consider that is, like, a hugely generous thing that, like, I think, I think it helps to name, to bring people into the idea, and to state something I think really obvious that I think everyone knows here, but maybe we haven't explicitly said, um, a lot of these trappings of, of looking at accountability as punishment comes from, like, people falling into what they know, and what they know are the systems that are in place, and the systems that are in place center this criminal legal system that like we all are trying to imagine beyond. And, and so it's often a struggle to even start the conversation to say, okay, what you know is what you know, but we're trying to imagine beyond that, which so many people in this room, I just wanna uplift the work that you're doing around that. Um, and that, that's visioning work. And there's not, you know, there's not a, a curriculum to get there, and it's, it's uh, the things people were saying on the panel about there are multiple stories at the same time. That's not like what we know. That's imagining a different way of being together. That like harm can happen and your story can be true, but another story can be true. And that you're acknowledging that you've harmed someone is not an immediate having to, you know, go into this atonement punishment moment, but rather like how do we transform that together? How do we acknowledge that? Um, you know, how do we bring like generosity into the conversation? So just, just to know that this is like visioning and creating a different way that that doesn't replicate systems. I think is it's that's like work to even get there. I, I really appreciate the the piece you brought in about like what we already know and just like what we're we're swimming in because it's like. You know, how many episodes of Law and Order have I watched? <laughs> you know, uh, I haven't actually watched any, but I wanted to be relatable. So, so I feel I shame there now. Yeah. <laughs> I feel... No, no not, from, not from a place of like, it was more just like, how can I be a relatable human being up here? Uh, I'll pretend that I watch Law and Order with you. Um, no, I'm... Anyway, it's superheroes saving the day for me, so it's the same thing, right? Um, or not. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm learning so much up here, and there's, like, so much that it's just, like, yes, and. You know, I th this piece around accountable communities um, was such a, a sort of powerful framework, you know, when it was put forward. And I'm still struggling with the self-accountability piece. Um, and I think one of those accountable community moves, um, especially as a man, as a cisgender man, as a white cisgender man, that I had to learn to make to start to try to produce uh, accountable community was to actually learn to move in really close with folks who had been called out for harm and violence, right? So my knee-jerk reaction, the thing that was inside of me, the thing that I wanted to do was to act like I didn't know that person, act like we had no relationship to each other, right? I wanted to be with the good people, yeah. right? And that's, you know, and that's the kind of piece that we really, you know, I had to really learn to like break out of that um, for the sake of safety, for the sake of accountability, for the sake of everything I believed in, right? And so that's like a core competency that I hope like we can continue to build for ourselves that we can like teach the next generation is like, who is the person in the space that can actually move in really close to that person that caused harm. Probably not the survivor, right? It's not that person, but there's somebody, right? Move in close, connect, like build relationship there. Um, that's a core piece. And then the other thing sometimes I'm blown away by is like what we already have. Because um, now like I'm working in a setting that is very closely tied to the criminal legal system. Like we're in coordination with the Brooklyn DA. And what blows me away is 90% of the regular ass people who get offered the option of common justice when they're stabbed with a knife, like when they're robbed in their home, when they're held up at gunpoint, when there's attempted murder. 90% of the regular ass, this isn't movement people, this isn't punks, right? These are just <laughs> people living in Brooklyn, we're regular too. 90% um, uh, choose common justice over just send that person to prison. That blew me away. And that's what we already have. That's, that's what we're starting with. I, w I wanted to know. 
Well, I, you go I was first. just going to tag on that. You go first. Thank you. Well, thank you, yeah. Sonia. <laughs> um, there's so much love up here. It's so nice. So much. I, but I wanted to piggyback. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you, Esteban. I wanted to follow up with that, RJ, because I think that that's so real. Because, you know, in a lot of the work that I do, I, I think it's so amazing to get to witness people who have every right to choose punishment. And, and anybody here who heard their stories would be like, you have every right to do that, and who don't. And who are like, no, I, I don't want you to ha hurt more. And I also think that folks who have done harm, again, which is all of us, we, I think we're hungry for it. Because I know the moment I start talking about accountability or TJ to anybody, like non-movement people even also, I just see the whole table, like their shoulders mo relax. I see them be able to like, you know, like we all got our masks on and our armor on and we're ready, you know, like in case somebody comes to me, like I just see that relax and they, they're like, oh, I can take that off now. And then this, this stuff that, the conversation that follows that, I, I just feel like people are hungry. We, we, in the BATJC, we have started from ground zero. And we started with just like basic communication skills workshops. We had over 500 people register for our first one that was just how to listen, act, how to do active listening and how to share accountably. Like we don't have these basic skills and here we all are trying to be like, well, what do we do about murderers or rapists? Well, what do we, well, how do we not even, we, we forget violence, harm and abuse. We have a hard time with conflict and misunderstandings. We're about to do a lab on how to give a good apology in May. And it filled up like that. Like, so I, I just feel like I think there's so much of what we already have, you know? And anybody here who's ever received a shitty apology knows how terrible that is. And anyone here who's ever received a good apology knows how that completely reorients your whole state. Like, you, you're just like, I don't care. Come, come here. I don't care. It's, it's done. It's done, right? But that's the kind of alchemy and power that I want us to be able to wield together. Because when we talk about building accountable communities, communities are made up of individual people. And I think we forget that when we throw that word around all the time, community, community. But if we all individually knew how to take accountability for ourselves and were accountable to ourselves, it would, set, it would change everything. It would also set an amazing example for all the children and youth in our life who are always watching us and getting a heartbreaking example of what it means to be human. That's beautiful. Uh, Mia Mingus for president. <laughs> yes, y'all. Yes, no, I think? will say no to that. Yeah, I think so. Um, and anybody up here also. So I, I want to respond to Piper's question about the trauma piece and the, pe the pre-work of the trauma piece. And I, I want to do it um, by telling a story of my own accountability and a personal self-accountability story which I've told before, first, it took me a really long time to tell, um, and I will say this is a process of doing pre-work to be accountable, is first time I ever told a story, I deal with all my shame. I still feel it sometimes, like all clogged in my chest and my throat, I didn't want to come out, I was like nervous and sweaty, told just to one person, you know, then it was like five people, then a room of 20, then a room of 100, and now a room of 300, right? And that is also a process of coming to accountability is kind of breaking a silence and dealing with the shame to feel like you can. So, and it might not be a big story to you, but it was a big, for you, but it was a big story for me. So for me, um, and connected to trauma, right? So I grew up, I had child sexual abuse in my early history. Uh, my parents, a very big piece of my own traumatic experience was actually immigration. You know, leaving everything, uh, being here. My mother didn't want to be here. It created a lot of alcohol, alcoholism and neglect in my family. And somewhere between the CSA, the neglect, and the alcoholism, I became the type of person that was really high functioning, really good in school. But underneath, I was drinking, I was smoking, I was shoplifting, I was stealing, and I was lying. And I did that for years. I did that from when I was 15 till 21 years old. I went to Brown University and I stole my way through the Brown University bookstore. I'm telling you the truth, right? And um, so, like, that was what I did, right? It was like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Like, I can be here and get straight A's, and then, but I really need to do something to let the pressure valve out uh, because I cannot handle all the things that happen um, in my life. And I felt so much shame about it. Um, and I felt like a bad person, right? And um, 
what helped to change that was I moved back to New York after college and I started dealing with the child sexual abuse. I went to a free clinic here at Mount Sinai. Um, I also want to say this other thing that actually really helped me, with, with, which is making some connections to how accountability happens, is, um, and I want to bring in some stories I heard. Um, I did some listening sessions around restorative justice and one in the Navajo Nation with peacekeepers who actually do TJ and RJ, and they just call it something else, right? And one of the things that one of the peacemakers was saying in the Navajo Nation was that when young people come to her, the first thing that she does is she names their relationships to people. She names kinship and clanship. And when people start to feel a sense of responsibility that they belong somewhere and that they're responsible to, it actually increases accountability. So I noticed when I was 21 years old and I was teaching in a school with young people who were seventh and eighth graders and I was still shoplifting, and I, for no reason, because I didn't need to, I walked into a Duane Reed and I almost put something in my pocket and I thought about the kids that were in my class. And I said, if a fucking child saw me right now that I care about, I will never be able to live this down. And that's actually the thing that made me stop, wow. along with healing my CSA, along with dealing with the fact that my parents didn't, my mother didn't want to be here, right? So it was all of those things that led to those moments of accountability. And so if we like really break down the like hurt people, hurt people thing, what is the trauma that leads to the harm? It's breaking all of these things down. It's addressing trauma at all these levels, at the race level, at the social conditions level, at the interpersonal trauma level, right? It's actually, and I want to say this, that agency for the person um, that's trying to take accountability is huge. Like that they are still also the authorities of their life experience and they get to like figure out how to do it. Because one thing about trauma is it takes away your agency, right? So you have to like have agency in order to like figure out why something happened to me, how I heal, and now how I can be accountable. We have to separate out when someone's working on their healing trauma and when they're working on accountability. If, someone's, if you're working with someone who's trying to be accountable, but they're trying to heal some trauma and you're like, that's not accountable. You're like, I, you know, they're gonna be like, you don't hear me, you know, right? So there's all these things, there are all these nuances about how to like really do this work that's like de deeply respectful of the process. Um, not like I said, not expecting that folks are gonna come to accountability right away. Um, the sense of like, one of the things that I think is huge that I've seen in myself and all the work I've done with people who've done harm and blah, blah, blah survivors is when folks start to feel seen and heard and empathize with and witnessed and like you see me, I can now see you and I can now see what I've done to you, right? So there are all these things like when folks start to feel actually like separating the self from the act, self separating like feeling self-forgiveness, there's more accountability. Like there are all these ways that it's like coming into myself allows me to come into relationship with you and what I've done to you deeper. So there's so many things, right? There's so many nuances that the link between healing and accountability is so deep when it comes to trauma. Um, and that if we're doing stuff well with ourselves and with each other, and we're becoming this incredibly competent community around accountability and trauma, that these are all the things that we're paying attention to at the same time. I wanted to pick up on that piece about relationship. Thank you, Sarah. Because I, I think that we, I mean, it makes sense that we do this, but that we oversimplify relationship and we reduce it to just this bilateral thing between the person who caused harm and the, and the survivor. And like, I was about to say that there's three and just in listening, I'm, I'm already up to five. I think that there's five, <laughs> five relationships. Um, so there's, those are the, the, the sort of core two at the center of, of a process of harm or accountability. Then there's a relationship with a bystander, right? Um, so that could be people who were immediate witnesses, that could be the immediate people who were taking care of a, of a survivor, um, or who are living with the person who caused harm or in some direct exposure. So then, so that's three. Then there's the, there's like another, there's another level of a different type of bystander, which is this echo. It's the rumor mill. It's the person who heard from the person who, or who read the Twitter feed or who, right? Like there's this whole other people who end up having feels, <laughs> having their own narrative about what happened. And that, all of these relationships need to be accounted for, need to be addressed, need to be read in um, to whatever transformation is taking place, right? Uh, because it's not enough to just say, we're good now. We've now dealt with the, the survivor and the person who caused harm. You actually have to address the bystander communities as well. Um, 
And then there's this other piece, which we always forget as organizers, which is those of us who are actually shepherding the process. Mm -hmm. We, as organizers, per, like persistently, we obliterate ourselves from the, from the actual work. We're like, oh, I'm just an invisible agent. Like, I'm the Holy Ghost laying hands on whatever <laughs> this process is. And, and I say that um, and, and come to that, that place of relationship because I, in, in my own work doing this, um, and, and for me, again, this has mostly been work around um, intimate partner violence and sexual assault, um, I did so much, fell into my own organizing patterns of obliterating myself that I had been in, this, in doing this work for like three, four years before I realized that I was a survivor. Like, it was only through the process of helping other people. Like, this is, this is our shit. This is, like, how we roll. I'm not the only one who rolls like this. I see you. <laughs> so, like, years into it, I'm like, oh, yeah. And then what happened? Oh, yeah. And, then, and through hearing the stories, I'm like, oh, shit. Am I also a survivor from this and this and this? And who were my people to support me around my needs? And then also, what were ways that I might have crossed boundaries or not gotten consent? So then it, it complexifies actually the whole situation. And I think by at least holding the nuance of that map that there's at least five groups that need to be taken into consideration when we think about process, when we think about relationships, it is more than just what is the thickest relationship there, that there's other folks that we need to um, account for, including everything that Mia was saying about yourself, your own groups and communities that are holding processes. So so I want to I want to kind of dig a little bit deeper into that. So we've so we got a lot of really incredible questions. We only have about 15 minutes left, and so we won't be able to get to all of those questions. But I do think there is a couple that speak to a particular theme um, a around process, right, and around the role of organizers who are leading processes, um, TJ processes, you know, accountability processes, um, and so. I, I want, and I think anyone who has done, led a process, been a part of facilitating a process, has experienced failure. If it, yes, right? Like if you if you have never experienced failure while doing this work, I want to meet you outside. Like let's talk. <laughs> I want to understand. I was gonna say you're and doing it wrong. Like <laughs> right? Like how, how could you possibly be effective if you haven't failed? I don't know. Not I'm trustworthy. Like, let's let's That's talk more. Model. Maybe yeah. Anyway, write write a book, please. Like I, so 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 we you have absolutely experienced failure. Like we are trying to do something that is like near impossible in in a system that is like uh, that has everything is stacked against us, right? And doing this work, right? And are still at the same time trying to do it. And so, you know, so one of the questions is like, is about the impact of, 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 a, of a process that breaks down or fails, right? And also how some of those, when those processes kind of break down or fail, um, and, and potentially there's more harm done, um, you know, what are the consequences of that, right? And then how, um, where's the, where's the, like, the self-forgiveness and the self-accountability for organizers uh, within that as well? Um, so, so yeah, so if anybody wants to speak to that, that piece of the, the work. Um, oh, man. So, <laughs> mostly, <laughs> appreciate it. Thank I feel, like, so happy being in between Sonia and me. I'm just like, yes, yes. Uh, it's like all my dreams are coming true and just feel so happy. Um, so there's a kind of mythology uh, that around community accountability and around TJ that I've uh I tell the story sometimes uh, when I was working at an LGBT anti-violence organization and was doing that as my full-time job, we started having um, survivors call us and community members call us and ask us for the process. Um, and we all were like, we don't have a process, like, what's the thing, <laughs> is this a thing? Um, and then there was this idea that like, somebody else had it, we just hadn't figured it out yet. You just hadn't like read the right zine, like, and so like, <laughs> That's like, that was the idea. It's like, oh no, no, we know somebody who knows somebody who did a thing and it was successful. I'm like, cool, can I talk to them? No, because, they are, because it, was a, it was a myth, it was an urban legend. Um, and so then like, and so then it's really real. So then what happened is like, we started connecting. So we started talking to like, we're like, well maybe the people in the Bay have it. And we started talking, and they were like, you guys, we don't have it. They were like, they were like, we, we thought you had it. And we're like, no, we thought you had it. Um, and they were like, does New York have it? We'll go talk to New York. Do you have New York? It's like, I, please, no, we don't have it. Um, 
And it was so soothing to me because I was like, oh, this is an idea that's made up in our head. Like, this is an idea that it was, we have made up, that something exists, that there are people somewhere who have figured this out and they just didn't tell us yet. We just haven't talked to the right people. That is a myth. It's made up. Um, and how many times it is so soothing to people when I tell them that. Um, and more. And so, you know, this was like eight years ago. And so in the last eight years, people are doing more work. And I just want to right-size it for people because... Um, I think in all the conversations and in the excitement about being here, mostly, almost overwhelmingly, it goes badly. And the reason I heard uh, when this question was asked in the room, everyone would be like, oh, is because um, people feel really crushed by this going badly all the time. And we don't have right-sized expectations about what actually a process is. And we keep trying to make it something concrete that it's not. It's just not. And I don't think the path forward for us is by getting a better toolkit. Like, I just don't think that's the process. And I don't think that's how we're going to get there. I think we're going to get there by building our individual skills. And it's going to be hyper-localized. And just actually getting right-sized about this, like, magical idea that everyone's just got, like, these deep communities that can, like, support them through, like, a multi-year process around accountability. Like, that's not real. And we can't scale that. We cannot. Most people do not have that. And most survivors do not have that. And most people who are doing harm do not have that. And this is the thing I've, I've heard Mia say so much that I'm like, okay, cool, we're, we're on the same right track, okay. Um, which is like, even just to say, like, I have been doing this work deeply and trying to actualize it in my life. And for all the things, like the processes that I've seen in the last like 12 years, there are three that I would say like had any kind of success. And really only one of and a half of those, um, I would say the person's like, who was doing harm stopped doing that harm. like. And so actually getting right about what success is um, and that like getting really clear about our goals and the success might be like more connection. Success might be a better plan for next time. Um, but we just have to get right sized about this and stop building up the mythology about a process or a toolkit that we're gonna create that's gonna magically solve this problem because that's not real. And we have to get really right sized about the kind of isolation people are in and what it actually takes, which is just much more about this individual work um, than it is about like just creating the best toolkit. I want to make sure people hear what you just said, which is that the purpose is not just about, like you're missing the point if we think that the purpose is, a, is about some person being accountable or some survivor feeling healing and closure. The whole fucking purpose is to transform all of us and the community. And so if a process is, is quote unquote a failure, that's only by the measure of, did we, did we reflect on this? Did we learn anything? Nothing is a failure. Nothing is a, we might have failed a person, but the, but the idea that we can actually reflect and be like, well, what did we learn? What do we know? We have now, we've now flexed our muscle and we're, we're in a better position to do, a different, to do it differently next time. And so remembering that the purpose is, is bigger. It's actually about the community. It's about all of us. It's about shifting culture and gaining practice. And so if we reframe it that way, it's like, yeah, there is no failure. This just lessons and lessons and lessons and lessons. Can I? No, Esteban, exactly. And sometimes I talk about it like an ecosystem. Like I think people want, what, what we are in is a desert. People have these fantasies of like a rich, lush forest, right? And the desert is not bad. And it's like to the people who live there and the animals and living things that live there, yeah. they know how to get water. They know how to survive. They know. To someone who's never seen the desert, they're like, this shit is dead. There's nothing. To people who live there, we're like, but look at this life. Look at this life. This is amazing. Oh, this. And, you know, the downpours are amazing. When they happen, it's like, yes, the rain. But th they are few and far between. So you learn how to get water and survive in different ways. And I feel like that's how I think about TJ in this work is I'm like, I'm like, look, this is a barren beach, but look at these three shells that I found. These are, this is a success. And especially when we get into the realm of, um, so, you know, I do CSA work, but I also work on adult and adult violence and sexual um, assault and rape and domestic violence, ex intimate partner abuse. And like, the bar is so low. That's like, I feel like we have these expectations that are through the roof and we forget that like, when we talk about CSA, the bar, the success is, those children's parents believed them when they said that there was violence. That is how low the bar is. So just, I think we need reality checks of what success means. I, I love everything that you're saying. I'm like, yes, because I also feel like there is a lot. When someone who has done harm is willing 
to take accountability, even if they never take accountability, that's a win. In this society, at this historical moment, that is a win. When we are steeped in punishment and revenge and self-hate and loathing, that is a win. When a survivor is like, I am not going to use the criminal legal system, that is a win, or I can't, right? That is a win, right? So I also feel like we are doing a lot right, and I know it's fucking hard when things go wrong and they go bad and it doesn't feel good, but also, again, it's never going to be easy or comfortable, and it shouldn't be comfortable, because com comfortable, being comfortable and what is it called? Comfort and transformation do not live on the same block, you know? So we should not be comfortable. And things, things are hard, but what I want us to do is like queer and shift and transform our desires so we don't desire the easy anymore. We desire the hard. So we're like, yes. It is hard. Yes, we did that shit, and it did. these are the things that didn't go well. We're going to learn from them. We're going to see what we could do next. But look at all this shit we did well. We communicated well, and maybe, maybe we all don't hate each other by the end. That's a win, because come on now. Yes. Come on now, yes. right? Maybe some of the bystanders were like, we want to work on our relationship outside of this on our own. Right. That's a win, That's right? right? There's so much goodness. So I, I don't want to lose that. It's, I know it's hard, but I don't want to lose the good pieces of it that we can learn from. Yeah. Woo. Yes. Woo. I'm so grateful to be like, oh, so much good energy. Um, so I think the thing I want to add to that too is that like on the receiving end of like accountability, we also don't know what that feels like, right? Like, you know, so someone apologized to me recently who, who I was in a relationship with who, uh, who had caused a lot of harm to me. And I remember that when I received that, I felt undone. I felt undone in a way that I didn't expect. Like, it didn't feel the way I thought it would feel. It made me feel more vulnerable. It made me feel more angry because it left this sort of gaping chasm where I realized that there was other shit that no one had ever apologized for. And, and so I think, I think for survivors, it's important to also recognize that, uh, that when you receive that apology, it may not feel, it probably won't feel the way you think it will, and it probably will leave, like, open up some other things, right, in terms of your healing, right? It creates this kind of disorganization within you. Um, so I think that's the other thing, is like, that when we think about success, we have to also recognize that, like you said, it's hard for everyone, um, and it probably won't feel the way that we expect. Um, so the, the last question, it's, or I'm sort of synthesizing a lot of different questions. There's a common theme here that is showing up in, in many of the questions about um, now that TJ and RJ are you know, becoming um, more sort of legible or accessible to many, um, to, to more people, um, there's a way in which it becomes weaponized um, and becomes, uh, uh, aligned with or are used to bolster uh, push out culture, yeah. uh, particularly on social media. So I wonder if you could speak to, um, you know, the ways that we sort of continue to like, you know, to your, to your point, like redefining what we think about as success, uh, but also ensure that, uh, that these, that process is not being used to, um, in the service of uh, people who have done harm because they have privilege because they can, um, and who are using their privilege to create an outcome and a process that works for them and that further isolates survivors. Um, I know, it's a big one. <laughs> Maybe we'll just talk about this all day. We'll just like put this on the, but like, let's just, I, I wonder if you could speak to that. Really? I just feel like, are you ready? Yeah. You're getting the mic? Give her a sec. Okay. 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 Um, now I'm like everything's swirling. So I think that's a really important question. I also think like a lot of accountability as we're like trying to vision it is humbling and it's about like losing control for a minute and like not being in charge of what happens and like accepting harm happened and that like that accepting I think is is like a moment of like losing control over things and that's that's a really hard moment um like the tools to you know like the tools to to make sure a process is you know 
people are coming to it and like their their full self as best they can and really coming to it in you know with full intention um that's a whole question and i think what we also need to talk about is like how do you break through how do you like make sure someone's with you and like when is there a moment where you're like are you going through the motions is this really happening like we're expending so much time and energy like this needs to be real and like, you know, thinking about, you know, is, is it worth that time and energy? So I think it's a whole question, but I think like it, it really part of this practice has to be like supporting and encouraging someone in like letting go of control, not being in control of everything and, and like coming to like accountability and humility in a different way that like acknowledges all of, all of these harms that happen to other people and all of the, all the other people coming into it. So I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> I, I could jump in I just real quick. Well, I just wanted to say something about the last question, which was that like, if you try something, it's better than incarceration every day. If you don't call the police, it's better every day, all day, every day. Every day, trying something else is better than incarceration calling the police. So just forgive yourself, right? And like, don't be so shy, you know, and be a little bold and take some risks. And if it didn't go well, learn something from it and, and apologize mm -hmm. and be accountable and try it again, you know? And I think that that's really real. It's just like every day, incarceration is more harmful. Every day, calling the police is more harmful. So like to, to remember that. And the, something that we call like what Mia said, which I loved, is like to see it all as anytime somebody reaches out, even if they never reach out again, it's a success. It's a win. I call it the restorative impulse, the transformative impulse, the impulse to try something else. That's a damn success. If a survivor's call, they never call back. Damn it, you called once. Yes, we won. The impulse is there, right? So we have to see those as wins. And then on this whole like co-opting weaponizing thing, like, like I mean, it's like a five hour conversation, right? So, and I, I will say this in the restorative justice world is that there's been so much um, ways that it's been co-opted and brought into a system. And so if, if, and, and there's a way that, like, there's a fierceness around, among some restorative justice practitioners to say that is not restorative justice, right? And to have to really call that out and say, if you're a jailer, you can't say you're doing restorative justice. If you're in a system and you're a DA, you can't say you're doing restorative justice. You can't say that we're doing restorative justice circles with the police. You can say you're doing trauma trainings for the police. You can say that maybe you're helping them understand their power, but you can't call those things restorative justice. So we stop using the word to mean everything and actually use it to mean what it's supposed to mean. And because it's be become, uh, you know, gone on the co-optation spectrum, it's really hard to, to work with, you know, to bring that back. I would say the other thing is none of this is scripted. So any anytime you're looking for a college, you, first of all, it shouldn't be in a college and it shouldn't be a degree program. It's, con it's like the stuff we learn from each other, right? So, and then if you're looking for something and somebody says, this is the script, you say that's not restorative justice. There's no script. There is no script. It is about being localized. It is about being individualized. It's about like learning from each other. It is about the wisdom of people knowing what to do with each other. And there are a number of us that do the work that way, and there are a number of us that don't, and I will say that about my own community, and I will be very, very real about like, no, somebody says, what training to go to? I say, go to these three trainings, don't go to these three trainings, and that's it. And it doesn't mean that the whole thing is a horrible, you know, that like the whole process of restorative justice is wrong. It means that some people are doing it wrong, and some people are doing it the right way, and I think that has to be a very, very deep, real conversation about that. Thank you. Yes. And to your question, Piper, I feel like another way that I've seen uh, TJ and RJ, which is awkward because it's also my name, um, <laughs> that I've seen it, it weaponized is actually um, to shame survivors for accessing orders of protection, right? For calling the police when they didn't know what else to do, right? For seeking, like, some punitive responses to the person that hurt them. Um, and so I like also want to lift that up, that I think we should come from an ethic of creating more options for ourselves and other survivors, rather than like using these frameworks to actually create more and more narrow uh, possibilities for folks. Um, and then secondly, I, I think sometimes there can also be a pressure to be like, oh, this is the really radical work, this is the work, right? And um, kind of, coming back to the framework of accountable communities is like actually running these 
processes around specific incidences of harm, although we talk about them a lot when we get into these rooms, and we talk about them a lot because we really need to, because we need to talk to each other and we're like trying to figure out this thing that is really hard, right? And we keep messing up. But let's not forget that like sometimes like building the accountable community does mean those daily acts of grace, does mean the daily care work that we're involved in, right? Or it even means that organizing work that you do to ensure that there's affordable housing in your community, right? That can also be understood as a form of building accountable communities, creating the structures within which people have stability and safety in their lives. Thank you, RJ. So we, we actually have to wrap up, but can, can I just five more, thank you, thank you. Like two minutes? Okay, all right, never mind. All right, yeah. It's okay, but you know, we, you, all right, fine. So, we will have the rest of the day to continue this conversation, um, but can we please all take a moment to thank um, our incredible panel. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Yes. Yes. <laughs>